It was incredible, and I was kind of, it was touch and go, because it's so different from the first album, um, but it's also real, and nobody really releases real albums anymore, like it's honest, and it's exactly what we're going through, and exactly what I was going through, it's just, it's, it's a completely real album, like it, what I'm talking about in it is exact. Yeah, but at the time I thought it was a good idea because I was on a lot of drugs then and I was constantly drunk. So at the time it seemed like a real good idea and then since it came out everyone's just fully all up on my shit about it. We have, a, we have our suspicions of how that night came about because there were a lot of unexplained things that happened that night that led up to me being that messed up that people were there that weren't supposed to be there and they were spending a lot of money on things for me that they weren't supposed to be spending a lot of money on and we kind of feel like it might be a kind of behind the scenes publicity stunt at my expense yes I mean, it is, by like, by definition. I mean, I'm not the only person in the band by far with the issues, like everyone has their vices. Um, I think we're definitely slowing down with it, but I mean, it, it's, it's, it's what we do, it's what we enjoy doing. And however much we are slowing down, we, we make sure we don't do anything before shows, like maybe have one or two drinks. If we've got like big stuff coming up, like a big festival or like TV appearances and stuff, we make sure we stay calm and stay cool for it. Uh, if anything, they've brought us more together. Because whereas before, me and Ben would fuck off and get stupidly drunk and come back and the other guys sort of got drunk by themselves and it kind of comes into argument because we never hang out. Because now, everyone's in on it. Everyone gets shit-faced together and... I don't know. It's, if anything, it's kind of brought us together. Don't touch heroin. That would be the one. And don't fuck that one stripper. Or if you do, use two condoms because the first one's going to split. Alright, so in that 2011 tell-all interview, which I just showed you, uh, which took place not that long after the release of the Reckless and Relentless album, you heard Danny talk towards the end. Well, first of all, that was pretty intense, am I right? Danny, like, that interview was kind of sad. Danny was obviously going through some stuff, which, you know, paints a good picture of, you know, where the band was and specifically where he was, like, mentally and in life during that album cycle um and also at the end of that you heard danny talk about something called the seattle incident now what is the seattle incident you may be asking yourself well here goes i'm about to sum it up for you a lot of you may know this was a pretty highly publicized thing at the time so to set the stage in march of 2011 asking alexandria set out on the first headlining tour in support of their new rec record reckless and relentless aptly titled the reckless and relentless tour with opening acts Emure, chiotos miss may i evergreen terrace and lower than atlantis quite the stacked bill also just a random side note but this was a super crazy time in the warp tour scene in in general early 2011 this was right around the same time as like the johnny craig macbook scandal um you know austin carlisle was returning to of mice and men around this time i think ronnie radke had just gotten out of prison and falling in reverse was about to start so this was a pretty eventful period for the for warp tour bands in general at the time anyways so on march 29th of 2011 the uh, Reckless and Relentless Traveling Tour Package came to a venue in Seattle, Washington called Studio 7. Oh shit, I forgot to turn on my ring light. <laughs> Hold on, I need to turn that on. Is that a problem? I knew something was missing. 
I'm I'm just gonna keep rolling with it. <laughs> I'm just gonna turn that on right now and pretend. Let's just pretend that that's been on the whole time. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> All right. Boom. Hell yeah. There we go. Now we're on YouTube. Okay. Uh. Yeah. On March 29th of 2011, Reckless and Relentless Tour came to Seattle, Washington, Studio Seven, and basically, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm gonna get right to the point. Uh, when Asking Alexandria took stage, the first couple songs, you know, people kind of noticed, eh, this is kind of shaky, not necessarily on the band's behalf, but on Danny's performance, people were like, eh, this is a little shaky, this is a little weird, he sounds a little weird. Hey, I fucking walk and crawl! wasn't performing very well, he sounded kind of bad, and wasn't really singing the right words, and right off the bat people were a bit confused. Uh, but before long, after like a few songs into the set, it became clear that Danny was absolutely fucked off of his tits. Uh, and I'm talking like shit hammered, like he was blacked out, out of control, he could barely stand up, he was like laying down on stage and he kept jumping into the crowd like pointlessly over and over again he was screaming absolute nonsense over the songs um which is was actually kind of cool it kind of made asking alexandria sound like a grindcore band or something for a second <laughs> said he kept diving into the crowd the whole time and at one point he appears to be hitting somebody in the crowd i don't know the the dude was just was just going insane he wasn't singing the songs right um the audience was berating him and at one point they were chanting drunk piece of shit drunk piece of shit as the crowd grew angry with danny's out of control drunkenness ben tried his best to maintain order and keep everyone calm and controlled and thank everyone for supporting them and apologize for danny's behavior between songs he did a really good job of um what's the term i'm looking for damage control just controlling everything. I think there's a, I think there's a damage control. I don't know. At one point uh, in the set, Ben infamously asked the crowd if they would support the band in putting Danny, his best friend, through rehab and getting him better. That's like almost verbatim what he said. Uh, the crowd cheered. Danny the way he used to be, put your hands up. That is me. Who prefers him now? Put your hands up. There's like three people. Wait, 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 wait. Ignore him, ignore him. Who here thinks, who here will support us and put in my best friend through rehab and making it better? Put your hands up. Thank you so fucking much. Fuck you, Danny. Fuck you. Honestly, ignore everything he says. 
Thank you for fucking supporting us. I'm supporting Thank you. you. fucking support. Thank you. I don't have a fucking chat. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. Put your hands up if you are booing. Put your hands up if you are booing. You are all cunts. <laughs> to make an option of after this show. Not all at once, because that would be unfair, but one on one, I personally will fight every single one of you. Each and every one of you that says rock and roll is fucking dead. Fuck that. Yeah. Fuck that. Everyone say fuck rock and roll. Uh, hey Danny, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Not fucking. Ignore him. Sorry, that was a He's a tit. That was a he is a tit. Fuck you. That was a bit of Fuck yeah, rock and roll! Who here thinks Danny's a tit? Put your hands up. There's no doubt that this was an incredibly emotional performance for the band. At one point, they just get Danny off the stage completely and they start having people from the crowd come on and fill, fill in on vocals. There's also like 30 seconds of cell phone footage that exists of Danny after the show outside talking to fans and I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Told to my fans. Why is that a bad thing? Can I take a picture with you? Have a bottle of water and calm down. Who wants me to stay out and fucking talk to him? I know. Hey, you guys, everybody say, Danny, we love you. Let's keep moving on, okay? Get help. Yeah, well, yeah, we know that. We're dealing with that shit. I don't fight with the I don't care. We've got him. Please, quickly. I'm not gonna fucking go back and stand with the I want to sit and talk to my fans. Hey guys, put away the camera! Now this incident, like I said, it ended up kind of being a big deal and attracted a lot of publicity within the scene. It was covered by all sorts of alternative music news publications with headlines popping up everywhere like asking Alexandria's Danny Warsnop too drunk to perform escorted off stage in Seattle or asking Alexandria's frontman makes a fool of himself bands somehow redeems themselves. Now Danny inevitably released a statement uh, addressing the incident on Facebook and the statement reads as follows. I'm sorry Seattle, tonight wasn't right. I'll be back making it up to you. I'm a fucking idiot. I should never blame my actions on my relapses, but tonight made me realize I have a problem. I for the first time in my life want to fix myself. I know now what regret is. I apologize from the bottom of my heart. I've relied on drugs and drinking to feel alive. I can't do that anymore. Tonight was evidence it's not me. I can't do it anymore. I love you all and I'm so sorry I've let you all down. Hopefully I grow to have some sort of compassion to myself. I live for self-destruction and that's wrong. Nothing changes when you're killing yourself with poison. I love you all and I hope you can forgive me. I am officially quitting drugs and drinking here and now. I want to clean up and sort my fucking life out. I'll never stop hating myself until I stop killing myself. Wow, intense. The band also announced that they would return to Seattle later in the year and play a free show to make up for it. Uh, now, if I were Danny at this time, or if I were someone close to Danny, uh, I 
probably would have told him that the best idea might be to get off the road for a little bit, postpone the rest of the tour, you know, spend some time at home, get your shit together, sober up, go to some AA meetings or something, figure out why it is that you know, he feels the need to kill himself with poison all the time, maybe get some therapy, I don't know. You know, that's just, I feel like that would be the healthiest, that would have been the healthiest thing to have happen after this situation, but none of that happened. No, nothing like that even happened. The band stayed on the road, they Danny included, they finished the tour. They carried on and finished the rest of the Reckless and Relentless tour business as usual. Now, contrary to popular belief, Danny never went to rehab and he didn't get sober like he said he would in this statement. This statement was basically like he probably was feeling this at the time that he wrote it, but it ended up being like basically bullshit because he didn't do any of that stuff. Uh, he was back to drinking heavily every day by the time summer of 2011 had rolled around. The funny thing is, a bit of a cut. funny thing is, I was off my tits as well. We all were, yeah. we were all hammered, but we could just hold our composure and still play. And yeah. so, you know, it was like, he just took it one step yeah. too far. He was like, okay, you can be wasted on stage, but don't be fucking blackout. Don't, be, mean, don't, don't be, be sleeping on stage and punching be, people. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But the funny thing about that is everyone's like, yeah, like Danny went to rehab and sorted himself out. Danny's never been to rehab. That's just uh, not that okay. That was like halfway through a tour. Yeah. Right, he still yeah. did the rest of the tour. Like. He, he, he never went to rehab or any of that. It was, not even after the no, tour? No, 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 no. Now, I think this, the Seattle incident and everything happening around this time was, in my opinion, a real turning point for Danny when it came to his place in Asking Alexandria. Nowadays, the band always mentions in interviews how part of the reason why the early years of Asking's touring career was so toxic was because they apparently had management telling them that they needed to stay on the road and stay touring 24-7, year-round, no breaks. Apparently, they were being told that if they took a break from touring, and if they weren't consistently grinding all the time, that their career would end, that this would all go away, or it would get smaller, they needed to stay on the road for some reason. I, you know, I disagree with that. I think they were just trying to make all the money that they could off of these, you know, struggling young men, um, who are, some of which were unraveling at the seams. Either way, which is fucked up in itself. That's a whole other can of beans. But in my eyes, Danny should have spent some time off the road after the Seattle incident. It's very possible that he and the band were not allowed to. I'm not sure. Just speculation based off of what I've heard. But this Seattle show, if you ask me, marked a very noticeable change in Danny from then on out. After the show, he was just different. Instead of back in the Stand Up and Scream touring cycle where he had life in his eyes, he was super energetic and into it on stage. He was hungry. His vocals sounded great every night. You know, he pretty much murdered every single show up to that point. Once the Reckless and Relentless era came around, you know, especially following this Seattle show, Danny all of a sudden was very hit or miss as a vocalist, especially live. He still had great performances here and there, uh, but more often than not, he started looking pretty bored and disinterested on stage, kind of standing there and casually walking around all calm and smug with very little energy a lot of times, seeming like he was just phoning it in, you know, with sunglasses on, a lot of times not performing his vocals very well either. <laughs> Sometimes there were shows where Danny just straight up didn't look or sound like he even wanted to be there at all during the Reckless and Relentless touring cycle, uh, which started following the Seattle incident and was never really the case before that. Definitely a big turning point for Danny, as well as his relationship with his bandmates and his, you know, overall interest in being the leader, the face of the gigantic, unstoppable machine that was asking Alexandria during this time. But... More on all of that later. So, after the Reckless and Relentless tour wrapped up, the band headed out for some European tour dates in April of 2011 with While She Sleeps, Chelsea Grin, and Of Mice and Men. The band then jumped on the entirety of that summer's Vans Warp Tour, playing the coveted main stage spot, the biggest stage, with the most hype bands on the whole tour. Uh, unsurprisingly, this was a summer of continued drunken debauchery 
victory for the boys, and it looks like they were really living it up. And even though we're at that point where Danny was often very hit or miss live, we got a few really energetic, emotional performances from Danny uh, this summer, most notably this show in North Carolina. Check it out. <laughs> However, while getting on the main stage at Warp Tour was a huge feat for the band, they were definitely accomplishing a huge goal, which they had set from the start, you know, it was a dream come and true. Uh, it seems like behind the scenes, this was actually, <laughs> surprise, surprise, a pretty dark time for the band, specifically our uh, aging scene cowboy, Danny Warsnop. There were many interviews with him which took place over the course of this tour where he was looking a little rough and talking in depth about how much much he was drinking and partying during that time. Despite his little PR uh, statement earlier in the year about getting sober, he was quite unapologetic about how much he was drinking uh, uh, on Warp Tour. I literally just walked off stage. I usually judge my days by my intoxication level. <laughs> and Colorado, because of the elevation, usually allows that to be quite high. Now what's your uh, drink of choice today? Ooh, I don't know. I might get some tequila. Ooh, really? Maybe. Okay. We'll see. Anything else best of happening on this tour? Uh, besides that, I don't really know because I've been incredibly drunk. Nice. Apparently, once I drove a forklift, <laughs> we're inebriated. <laughs> Where was this at? Uh, I think it's somewhere in Pennsylvania. I just woke up to a text the next day from somebody I don't know saying, "Thanks for the ride on the forklift. I'd have never made it back to my car." I was like, "Who the fuck let me drive a forklift?" You guys just played. I asked you. We did. How was the show today? It was great. <laughs> and what uh, did we one see? bit, one bit of the show, like I looked across, <laughs> and there was this chick, like she was really hot. Yeah. And she was there dancing like this, and I was like, <laughs> she's shaking her tits, and then she, bang, and the most glorious pair of breasts you've ever seen. Best interview you've ever had, right here. So I'm gonna go track her down later <laughs> and penetrate her vagina. <laughs> I, I read a thing, actually in AP Magazine, a little thing about what Warped Tour means to you. What, what is Warped? And, and you said that, you know, you guys are just, you don't do anything, either bad or good, half-assed. You go full, you go balls out regardless. So how are you doing, maintaining your composure with the big party that Warped Tour is? Um, <laughs> okay, no, we, before this tour, a lot of our friends have done it, and they were talking to us, and they were like, oh dude, like, it's easy to burn yourself out on Warped Tour, like, Take it easy, eggs. It's a party tour, like, you guys will fit right in. And we've got in trouble partying too hard. You got in trouble partying too hard? Clearly we've redefined what partying is. I'm John, from Bon Jovi. I'm... Gandhi. Gandhi. From India. From India. And you're watching Artisan News. And I'm drunk as f Awesome. It's great, he's, he's coming today. Yeah, he's coming to hang out with us he's today. He's on his way now. He's a good guy, he massive him, he penis. He texted me and said, I'm on my way now. He has a That's huge That's how I know that he's penis. now on his way. <laughs> right? Yeah, penis. That's the rules, yeah. I need to top I'm not getting on my knee on here. Fucking hate you. Fucking, you're a wanker, mate. Okay, now we can get to the serious questions. Oh, there are no serious, serious questions. questions. You're interviewing us now. Yeah, it's hot. We get in trouble. But... We get in a lot of trouble. I nearly died yesterday. He did. He, uh, he, I was taking a nap, and when I woke up, he was passed out by the pool with a bottle of tequila behind him. And so I kind of tapped my foot on his head to see if he would wake up, and he just sunk into the bottom of the pool. And I had to jump in and pull him out and survive him. 
Don't drink. Don't, no, don't drink copious amounts of tequila and vodka. You can drink, but... So, fun fact. Uh, I think this is pretty cool. He actually confirmed all of this, uh, you know, that this was a pretty dark time for him in a later interview, which took place a year following in summer of 2012, where he actually opened up about the personal issues he was going through throughout Warp Tour of 2011. Check it out. It, it, it is a very harsh reminder at parts of how fucked up I was and um, how messed up my life was getting. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird looking back on. And even like seeing pictures of me from, from back in the day and like you can you can see how many drugs I was doing and how fucked up I was and how unhappy I was. Well, I'll have to say that on the Warped Tour video that we did, um, you guys have posted on your Facebook page and just went through the roof as far as views. But a yeah. lot of the comments that I read were how great you looked, how much better you sounded. Um, just, well, I was just, I mean, just I was still very much an alcoholic drug addict mess during that time. Um, but I was, uh, I, I, I mean, in, in some, some parts of Warp Tour, it was the heaviest I'd ever drank and right. like me and a couple of my friends who I don't know if they want to be named, so I just won't. <laughs> um, I mean, we were going through four to five handles a night. Yeah. Like we'd kill a handle of vodka in 30 minutes, just straight, just chugging it and it's, it was it was a very dark time and I wasn't happy and I mean uh, during that tour I think I let loose more because I was in the mindset of that was going to be my last tour. Oh. I had wow. every, I had every intention of leaving the band after that tour. Really? I was just so unhappy with what I was doing and didn't want to do music anymore necessarily. I was I, I'd reached such a low point that yeah I, I just I gave up and was in just such a downward spiral that I didn't want to do it anymore. And most of the fans were still under the assumption that he had been to rehab and consequently gotten sober following the Seattle incident just a few months earlier. Obviously, he was still going through what only could be some dark personal shit that would cause him to drink at the rate he was drinking at the time. That's a scary life to live, really, and Danny was fucking living it. It was like the rock and roll lifestyle, but like now it was starting to be the dark rock and roll lifestyle. The, you know, not really horns anymore. It's kind of like... <laughs> you know, scary ne negativeness, awfulness. Once again, not to point fingers at their record label or management or whatever, but honestly kind of to point fingers at them. Maybe I am. Uh, but keeping asking Alexandria... <laughs> I know I keep bringing this up, but like, I just seriously think, yo, that like keeping them home for like six months and trying to get Danny some real help, uh, you know, I, it wouldn't have lost them that much money. They were very big at the time. It wouldn't have ruined their career if, you know, the band was a cash cow at that point. They were scoring big charts on Billboard. If anything, it would have helped their career in the long run. But obviously, you know, if had they had taken some time off at that point, but obviously hindsight's 2020, blah, 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 whatever, that didn't happen. It almost seemed like asking Alexandria was starting to turn into a pressure cooker at this point. That pressure was building up bigger than they maybe thought, you know, they could handle. Uh, and people were starting to crack under all of that weight and pressure, specifically a young Danny Worsnop, who was literally only like 20 at this point. He was 20. Like, fuck. Think about yourself at age 20. Like, if you're older than that, like, think back to when, when you were 20. Imagine if you were going through all this shit. Like, I, I, I feel like Danny in some ways handled this shit better than some people would have. You know what I mean? It, like, it could have been worse. But anyway, neither here nor there. Whole other can of beans. So, following the Warp Tour in 2011, the band spent that November out on the World War III tour, which they co-headlined with Hollywood Undead, with opening acts Borgor, uh, remember Borgor? We Came as Romans and Drugs, a pretty eclectic lineup there, pretty cool. <laughs> is still around i don't i don't listen to edm i don't know maybe that's a you know but i, I remember at this time skrillex was getting big and all that 
all that shit. So it was all like dubstep trendy. Oh, speaking of dubstep, I didn't even put this in my script, but around this time, <laughs> cause it, I, I feel like it doesn't really matter that much, but I guess I'll throw it in here cause it, it did exist. There was a release uh, that came out I, I, sometime in fall of 2011 called Stepped Up and Scratched, which was like a dubstep remix version of, um, it's both Stand Up and Scream songs and Reckless and Relentless songs. It's kind of like that thing Bring Me the Horizon did. It's basically the same thing, just like a remix album came out during this time. I don't know. I don't really think that much uh, importance of it in terms of like Asking Alexandria's career because they didn't make any of the songs and they were kind of pushing away from the whole electronic aspect of their band during this time anyway so it was kind of a weird release put together by like the label but that was a thing stepped up and scratched the band finished off the wild year of 2011 opening for avenged freaking sevenfold on the buried alive tour hey remember about a year ago uh you know well not not a literal year ago but in terms of asking alexandria's story a year ago like in the first or second video i did before this they were talking about how like for the second album you know we want to push to playing with bands like lincoln park and avenged sevenfold I think Avenged Sevenfold they named that they want to start touring with. Well, here they are fucking opening for Avenged Sevenfold. You know, their rock journey dream was coming true. They opened for them on the Buried Alive tour, playing arenas with fellow openers Black Veil Brides and Hollywood Undead, which was a pretty perfect bill for asking Alexandria to be on during this time. All right, so uh, real quick, two things that I just wanted to blaze through that I literally didn't even put in my script. There, there are so many like nuggets of information about asking Alexandria like during this time period there's such a that's why this series is ending up ending up so long because you know there's such a there's so many things that happen but two two things that I just wanted to blaze through because I, I like they're not like that important I guess but it, it, I felt like it would be un, like uh, lacking of me not to mention these things you know um, so for one thing during this period in late 2011 they were also on this thing called the warrior show which was the short-lived it only lasted two episodes and it was like this this thing uh, organized I think by Sumerian records and it was uh, like that wrestler the ultimate warrior from the from the like the 80s and 90s that guy and he came in and like asking alexandria showed up to this gym and he basically yelled at them and made them work out and lift really heavy weights until they like threw up it's a really interesting uh video to check out it's on youtube uh and it the stuff that warrior was saying is actually really inspiring like he was like he was really like laying into danny because i guess they had told him that danny was kind of off the rails during this time so he's like you think you're the chosen one, Danny? This is really funny. You should, you should check it out. So we're going to find out now just what you're made of. Just how much you've got in your fucking soul. Because you know what? You drank a bottle of fucking wine. That is fucking disrespectful to me, you motherfucker. Maybe you are the chosen one, Danny. It is interesting, too, because the band... I, Danny specifically as far as I know did get really into exercise and weightlifting later like currently he's into that shit and at the time like they were drinking bottles of wine uh, in the gym which the warrior got really mad about so yeah there was that another thing they did around this time were uh, a set of three music videos uh, the series was called Through Sin and Self-Destruction. I guess it was pushed as a little, like, three music videos put together, equaling, like, a little mini-movie. Um, and it was uh, for the songs, I believe, Dear Insanity, To the Stage, and the song Reckless and Relentless. And it was basically the short film of just, like, all the drunken debauchery that the band was going through, but, like, set theatrically you know the, like the plot is they're supposed to play this show but then Danny gets drunk and like almost dies and then they have to give him this antidote then they rush to the show and it ends with them playing it's pretty cool um it was pretty big at the time um so yeah those are two things that happened moving right along um so now we are in early 2012 early 2012 2012 is kicking off y'all remember it I remember 2012 that was a pretty good year I will show you an interview with Danny from January of 2012, where he just gives a little update on, you know, how he's doing, what he's been up to, and spoiler alert, he's apparently kind of actually sober now. Check it out. There are many. Um, I did the, uh, the very stereotypical get in better shape one, and I mean, I'm eating a lot better and working out every day. So, so far, so good. 
we'll see how what the future holds. Um, probably easier to be honest because um, my schedule vocally is already um, so strict. I'm used to that regimented lifestyle, yeah. and I, I don't drink anymore. So it's um, yeah, I've got all that free time in which I can fill up with working out and working. Yeah, I've got I've got well, I, that's that's working on right now. Um, I've been getting my band together for that, and all the management and the entire team behind it. So I have meetings I mean, at least once a week for that, even while I'm on the road. Um, and I have a clothing company as well, so there's all the work on that. And I manage a band, so there's all the work on that. And um, I mean, I do photography as well, so there's all the work on that. And then there's all the training and stuff. I really have no other time to do stuff. I watch movies and play with my dogs. That's about it. And I drink whiskey, lots of whiskey when I'm off tour. Because I don't drink on tour, so I make sure I get at least a bottle of whiskey in me a day off tour. So, he seems fairly healthy and good in this interview. But, um, you know, he said he was sober on tour, but drinks a bottle of whiskey a day off tour. I don't know. As long as he's sober on tour, I guess, and exercising and treating himself a little bit better, that's good. That's a good sign. I'm glad that Danny was, you know, treating himself better around then. So, the band kicked off 2012 with a headlining tour called the Still Reckless Tour in March and April, uh, with opening acts Trivium, Durr and Gray, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, <laughs> I See Stars, Motionless and White, and the Amity Affliction. Now, this tour was promoted as supposedly being the last tour that was going to be part of the touring cycle for the Reckless and Relentless album, and at that time, the upcoming third Asking Alexandria album was slated for release later on in 2012. Danny really stepped up his game live around this time. The whole band did, really. If you look at any footage of them from the Still Reckless tour, or really any footage from this era throughout 2012 as a whole, when Danny was sober on tour, the band was absolutely fucking murdering it live and putting on the best, most energetic shows since the early days in the Stand Up and Scream era. The band was really killing it during this time. And Danny was looking happy and genuinely into it again around this time, unlike his tendency throughout 2011 to sometimes look a bit miserable on stage. Like, he looked like he was, you know, into it again, which was awesome. The rest of 2012 was basically spent touring, obviously. They were always on tour during this time, as I've explained. Uh, and, you know, they were prepping for the release of their upcoming third record, writing, recording. So after the Still Reckless tour, the band then hopped on that summer's Mayhem Festival, which is basically like a heavier warp tour, for those who don't know. It's more of a tour as opposed it's like a traveling festival just like the warp tour is um i think it's actually put on by kevin lyman who runs the warp tour um so they did that in 2012 alongside a bunch of bands like slipknot slayer motorhead the devil wears prada and anthrax to name a few that's a pretty good way to spend the summer <laughs> if you're danny warsnop i guess That fall of 2012, the band then headlines the Monster Energy Outbreak Tour, <laughs> which is a funny name for a tour, uh, alongside openers As I Lay Dying, Suicide Silence, Memphis Mayfire, and Attila. Around this time, the band also released a new single, the first song released from their upcoming third album, a song called Run Free. <laughs> Now, things seemed pretty hunky.
hunky-dory for the band during 2012, am I right? I mean, Danny was sober and visibly healthier and was taking way better care of his voice live. The band was headlining these huge tours with, like, big bands opening for them now, uh, preparing for the release of Album 3, which at that time was slated to be, you know, their most anticipated as well as their most, you know, uh, people were saying it was going to be their most successful album yet. On the surface, like on the outside looking in, it definitely looked like things were going very well for the band, and it seemed like they were, you know, finally starting to get their shit together after the past few years of crazy recklessness and relentlessness for that matter. Excuse the pun. Let's take a closer look, my friends, because underneath the surface, if you pop open the hood, if you will, there was still, as always, some trouble brewing in the world of Asking Alexandria. Now, although Danny was seemingly in good health and spirits during this time, it is very important to note that at the start of 2012, Danny actually announced and started talking in interviews about a new band that he had started outside of Asking Alexandria called Harlot, which apparently started as, like, it was originally just supposed to be Danny's solo project that he had started working on sometime in 2011, uh, but eventually, once 2012 had rolled around, he basically turned it into a whole separate entity, a whole new band of its own called Harlot. Harlot, according to Danny at the time, was going to be a straight-up rock and roll band. Surprise, surprise. You know, unsurprising considering Danny had always been very vocal about the fact that he loves 80s hair metal and rock and roll music, so it just makes sense that he would start another project, uh, which would be an avenue for him to channel this music that he loves and satisfy that creative itch you know, which he just can't really scratch in a band as heavy and as kind of current uh, as Asking Alexandria were at the time, even though Asking Alexandria were trying to at least aesthetically be kind of more of a rock band now. So just to quote some interviews from uh, around this time period in 2012, Danny said the following regarding the new Harlot Project. So these first quotes are from very early 2012 uh, when the band was still on the Still Reckless tour and Harlot was still supposed to be just Danny's solo project. There are some incredible musicians behind the solo record, he explains. A guy called Bruno Agra, who used to play drums for Lady Gaga, and a guitarist called Jeff George, who played guitar for Eminem. We've been writing and just booked our first batch of shows for the solo stuff, War Snop continues. I'm really excited to just get the CD out. We've got 38 songs ready. We should probably stop writing or the first CD is going to be a box set. We're putting a lot of work into it. I don't want it to be classed as a side project. I want it to be its own entity altogether. However, this one is important. However much I love the music that I write with Asking Alexandria, and however much fun I have making it and playing it, it's not the music I listen to. This album means that I get to create music that I truly love. These songs are a lot more personal. Man, this shit really makes me think, because I'm like, how exactly do you end up in a band, this huge band, where you don't even necessarily really like enjoy the music that you play? I mean, obviously he has personal attachment to the Asking Alexandria songs because they're his, it's his band, but like, it's like, I'm not a fan of country music at all, right? If Like, I don't know jack shit about it. I, yeah, I'm not saying it's bad, like, if other people want to listen to it, that's fine. It's just never been my thing. It's like if I ended up as the singer of, like, a country band or something. I would hate that, you know? Like, it's a, it was a really interesting position that Danny was apparently in, you know what I mean? Because uh, being in a band, you know, that you, he was, you would have to devote yourself to that shit. Touring all the time and all that. Anyways, later on in 2012, when the band was on the Monster Outbreak Tour, Danny said this about Harlot. So now, at this point, Harlot is... An actual band, not just a solo project. Uh, he said the following, quote, Harlot is straight up rock and roll. Warsnop exclusively told Audio Inc. Radio. <laughs> There's a great reaction in the industry to it, and we haven't even released music yet. All of these mind-blowingly huge people are so excited and wanting to be a part of it, and I'm very taken back by it a lot. It's bigger stuff than I've ever seen before, and I'm definitely excited for this to come together. Wow, that's interesting. Is he just talking about Sebastian Bach? Because I know they were friends. <laughs> Who are these big industry people that were like, yeah, harlot. Um, I don't know. That's cool, though. That's interesting. So, 
you know, it's definitely not uncommon for a musician to be in multiple bands at once or have multiple different projects, different creative outlets, and have them all be uh, able to flourish as they should in harmony with one another without really stepping on anybody's toes. There are people who are able to do that. Uh, the thing was, once Danny had announced his new project, Harlot, it caused a lot of fans and probably his bandmates and Asking Alexandria too to worry about what that will mean in terms of his interest and involvement in Asking Alexandria. There's the aspect that Asking at that point in time was a full-time job. Uh, none of the other members had other projects. I mean, Ben Bruce did say around this time that he was working on a solo album too, but it, it never really got done. It never got finished. Um, all the other members were fully committed to Asking Alexandria, and that was it. Uh, but the real issue, besides any timing issues or management issues or whatever, was the fact that, like I've been saying, Danny had been very open and honest and blunt in interviews for the past few years about how you know, he uh, enjoys writing and playing heavy metalcore music with Asking Alexandria, but he apparently had no real interest, like he doesn't listen to that music in his personal life. He had always been very brazen about the fact that he was a rock and roller. To put it bluntly, once 2012 rolled around and Danny had announced Harlot and showed excitement for that project, much more excitement than he was showing for Asking Alexandria at the time, the fans were worried that Danny was going to eventually leave Asking. Alexandria due to his desire to play his rock music with his new band. It started to cause some sort of like unspoken rift between Danny and the rest of his band members. The common perception amongst fans at least was that while the rest of the members of AA liked classic rock music too, if you remember from the first Asking Alexandria video or I think it was the second one, you know, Ben Bruce was also very gung-ho about being more of a rock and roll uh, style band. But at the end of the day, they all really, you know, the rest of the band really just kind of still wanted to be a metalcore band and make heavy music true to the sound of old Asking Alexandria. First album was just, was write an album, send it out, but the record smoke, we had a lot more time just to actually you know, go into it, like, each put our own, like, spurt. Danny's definitely got a lot of 80s, influences in, in records and like this and it is definitely more rock yeah and could you see that as the direction you want to head in in the future um, we want to go we want to go heavy <laughs> really heavy yeah. That's the route we're taking. And Danny was becoming increasingly more frustrating for them to work with and for them to find common musical ground with because Danny was just apparently fully out of his metalcore phase, had no interest in it, wanted to play rock music. And Danny, from when you guys started to this day, why don't you tell us a little bit about the progression of the band for those who are like, you know, checking out like Asking Alexander for their first time, we have Mayhem Fest who are watching this right now. Why don't you tell them a little bit about the... Um, well, we started out as children writing... Um, music that was uh, very obviously the first music we'd written and um, naive in many aspects but it, that's that it, in which lay the charm of the music. Both of your albums are very different Stand Up and Scream and Reckless and Relentless there's so many differences and you are in the works you got a new album yeah yeah, I do. yeah I do and so what do you think is going to be the biggest difference between the new album and the previous releases? I mean, primarily the first notice that people will, uh, the first difference people will notice will be the title. It's going to be yeah. a completely different title <laughs> altogether. Um, the band name will, however, remain the same. Yes. Um, artwork, again, will probably be different, although we're not, we're not sure about that yet. <laughs> we may just do the same thing again. And what about the music? How's the music? Um, they're gonna, that's going to be different. Yes. We're not going to do the same songs anymore. But I know you also... No, we've, uh, we've been spending a lot of time working on it, and I, I, I personally think this, this album is the first time we've actually written real songs. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the last two albums had uh, their, their fair share of filler tracks, and I, I, I just don't... I don't know why, and this, this may piss some people off, I don't think they're real songs. I don't think they're mm. particularly good songs. It's music, and it's done very well, and I'm very proud of it, but they're not real songs. Yeah. And I think this album they are, and um, we've really worked hard on kind of making them as real and honest and truthful and 
um, full of passion and feeling as we can, and I think we've achieved it. In fact, starting in 2012, if you look at pictures of them or live footage, instead of looking like they used to, where it looked like a solid unit as a band, like they all looked like they were part of the same band, it started looking like the four members of Asking Alexandria plus some like cowboy rock and roll looking guy. Danny started looking like and embodying someone completely different than who you would expect to be and in a lot of ways who you would want to be the singer of a band like Asking Alexandria. In interviews around this time, Danny also started saying things like Asking Alexandria is a heavy metal band with a rock and roll singer. Yeah, so all that stuff started brewing around 2012 in preparation for their third record, but we'll pick up on Harlot and Danny's overall interest and involvement with Asking Alexandria later on, because as you could imagine, and as you probably know, that's not the end of that. <laughs> now, Oh my god, this is going to be my favorite part of this video. So real quick before we move on, just to give you an idea of what kind of guy Danny was around this time and exactly just what the rest of AA were having to deal with <laughs> with him around this era, I want to read you something real quick. Uh, in the summer of 2012, a lot of you probably remember this, Danny announced that he was writing a book, uh, an autobiography about his life and journey, which at the time was going to be called Am I Insane? Now, right off the bat, I don't know why you're writing an autobiography when, you know, you've only really been in the music game for like, three years at most, but pfft. well, that's what I'm saying. You'll see like, okay, he released, basically he released an early excerpt from this book that he was writing at the time. And I want to read it to you because it is pretentious as fuck, as fuck. It is the most, like this dude was high on his own aura as a human being, you know? So I'm going to read some of this to you. Dear whoever the hell stumbled across my innate scribblings. I already hate this. Um, <laughs> my name is Danny Warsnop. <clears throat> I was born on September 4th, 1990 in Beverly, England. I entered this world kicking and screaming, knowing nothing of how fucking important my being alive was going to be to so many people. Wow. What a, what a bold way to start this off. I grew up as unimportant and insignificant, as most in the small village of Gilberdike, as far north of middle of nowhere as you can go whilst still being a little south of you've never heard of it, by my forever supportive parents, Philip and Sharon, along with my younger sister, Kelly. Now, at the age of 21, damn, this dude's only 21 here, what the fuck, he seemed, he, he had the aura of a, like, a guy who was, like, 38, but I, I guess he was, like, 21, I guess that explains why he was trying to write a fucking book, an autobiography at that. I have toured the world and sang my songs to enough people to populate a small country. I've overcome a cocaine addiction that should have killed me and alcoholism that almost did. I've loved lost and loved again. In fact, I've fallen in love with almost as many women as I've fallen into bed with, and we will for now just file that under the category of how many? <laughs> I could just stop here. I mean, you already get the gist of this. Uh, you know, this dude literally thinks he's Steven Tyler. It's like, dude, your metalcore band, like, let's just zoom out here for a second. You were in a crabcore ass, like, attack, attack, rip off at the start metalcore band, right? Like if we're looking at the big picture here, you scored some big numbers at a time when the, when the genre was big. Uh, and now this dude is, you know, and, and he's only really been in the limelight for like a couple years, the limelight. He's not a real celebrity, but this dude is convinced that he's Steven Tyler or that he's Ozzy Osbourne or something. It's kind of like, like, I feel like this is what cocaine does to you. This being his book, but this is, it's like, this is the douchiest shit. I'm going to read a little bit more just cause it's really funny. So I guess I'm a rock star living the life you can only dream of as I once so eloquently put it. Danny Warsnop, the physical embodiment of sex, drugs, and what was that last part again? Rock and roll you say? Oh, God. Well, here's where things get interesting. You see, I am and always will be a rock and roller. I am and will, from now until my terminal breath, be a rock and roll singer. But my music is not rock and roll, no. The band I ironically am the front and center, high and mighty, plump up in my plumage and paraded around for is in every way a heavy metal band. I am not talking about Iron Maiden, ACDC, Black Sabbath, Ronnie James Dio heavy metal. This is scream till you spit blood, hate everything, fuck the world, and burn its mother heavy metal. What the f- 
hell is this? What kind of visions of grandeur is this dude having? Blah, blah, blah. Let's see if there's anything else interesting in here. All right, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and just read the end of this excerpt. Then we'll get back to, we'll get back to the, 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 the business. These days, I happily reside in my brobding, I don't know what that word is, world of beautiful music, beautiful women, and a beautiful bank account. Ugh, I roll. But it wasn't always so. My family was a completely ordinary one, average money, average house, average cars, average grades, average life, average. If there's one thing I've grown to detest more than anything else on this celestial orb we call home, it's average. Don't get me wrong, I wish not for a past riddled with poverty, but there is nothing more dull and uninspiring than average, and anyone who has experienced it in large doses will verify that in a heartbeat. Well, I can get behind that. Um, so, <laughs> so how, out of such ordinariness, did I become something so spectacularly not average and ordinary? What the hell happens in my brain, in my DNA, in my very soul that separated me from everything I was expected to be? Can it be that all that drink and all those drugs are either to blame and or thank? Truth is, I have no goddamn idea. This book is the collective insights of myself and those closest to me regarding my self-proclaimed condition of non compos mentis not sound of mind, often referred to as fucking mental. Yeah, okay, so this dude was, like, really feeling himself. So yeah, I just wanted to read that to give a little, like, this is the kind of dude that this guy was around this time. So not only was he, like, not into the music that they were playing, but he was also just, like, kind of a, kind of an arrogant, like, <laughs> douche. I don't mean to hate on the guy, but, like, come on, that was douchey. Okay, anyway, back to the, the real, the real shit. Anyways, like I said, uh, despite how much this book excerpt sounds like someone, you know, experiencing a, a, a cocaine high and writing about themselves, uh, Danny was, was apparently sober and healthy and in good spirits. The band was killing it live, still growing in popularity, about to release what was slated to be their biggest record yet, and all things considered, that's a pretty good place to be for a band. So... What do you think is going to happen next, my friends? Is everything going to be hunky-dory and just get better from here, or is everything going to fall apart again? All right, so let's get down to business. Uh, on August 13th of 2012, Asking Alexandria released a brand new single, the first taste of their upcoming highly anticipated third record, which was going to be called From Death to Destiny, which at this point was slated for release in spring of 2013. Now, Run Free is a bouncy, anthemic, arena rock-tinged metalcore track which features enough breakdowns and chugging and screamed vocals to keep the old fans happy, while also, for the first time in Asking Alexandria's history, really, having big, open, arena-ready choruses and positive, uplifting lyrics like, quote, this world's yours for the taking. Run free. Run free and wild. Lose your mind. Escape your inhibitions. Taste the wind. Let your hair down. Throw your hands up. Go. Let go. Forget the consequences. Go. Let go. Running free. This showed the band expanding their sound and exploring new uncharted territories and, dare I say, more mature horizons than Asking Alexandria had explored on their past records. Uh, Danny sounds a lot more grown up in his vocals, and this track definitely feels a lot more like a straight-up arena metal song, or like an arena rock, like alternative metal song, as opposed to scene kid oriented metalcore um, now following the release of their new single the band headed out on a fall tour uh, they were headlining the monster energy outbreak tour with openers suicide silence as i lay dying memphis mayfire and attila however just a couple weeks before this tour was about to start mitch lucker uh, singer of the band Suicide Silence tragically passed away after crashing his motorcycle and was unfortunately pronounced dead on November 1st of 2012. Uh, now, this was extremely tragic news for everyone in the scene at the time. Uh, very sad. Uh, you know, Suicide Silence were a very beloved and influential band, and Mitch Lucker was a very beloved frontman. R.I.P. Mitch Lucker, for real. <laughs> Now, 
Mitch's death apparently extremely affected Danny Warsnop. Uh, Danny was apparently sh so shaken up following Mitch's passing that he apparently fully relapsed on cocaine and alcohol around this time, so much so that he experienced a very scary overdose which almost killed him. Uh, Danny had described this experience in several different interviews down the road, but here's a good explanation from him regarding this relapse and overdose from an alternative press article in 2017. Danny states the following, quote, In Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard, there is a hotel called Grafton on Sunset where I lived for some time. I got rid of my place in Beverly Hills, and I was kind of in between places, not sure what I was going to do. I was recording from Death to Destiny, so I was there for a month, maybe two months, because I was in the studio. I was living at this hotel and not showing up at the studio more often than I was because I was on a massive drug bender, and it was a very dark time. It was actually right after Mitch uh, passed, so I was in a very dark hole. I was out of my mind. I think I'd been up for four or five days partying. It was lots of drinking drugs, but there wasn't much fun. Long story short, the night ended after everyone had gone. I'm laid on my back, convulsing and not able to move, kind of reading myself my last rites. I managed to get to the hotel phone, and for the life of me, I have no idea how this happened, but I could only remember one fucking number, and it was a girl I dated a few years before that. I called, and she drove out at a million miles an hour, and essentially saved my life and took me out to rehabilitate in, I think it was San Bernardino. In that moment, I was like, this is it. I'm dead now. Crazy. He also went into some more detail on this experience in an Instagram post from 2016. I thought this was interesting too. I want to take you back. Where? The Grafton Hotel in Los Angeles, California. When? The winter of 2013 at around 4 a.m. At this point in that room, there was a young Danny Warsnop laid on a bed with his heart beating out of his chest, a thousand dollars worth of cocaine running through his veins, and two bottles of whiskey in his stomach, shaking and trying to keep his eyes from rolling back into the back of his skull skull. That night was, needless to say, terrifying. Crazy stuff, dark stuff, very sad. Danny was officially back on his bullshit. Uh, after this relapse and even after this terrifying overdose, if you look back at interviews from after the fall of 2012 and throughout 2013, Danny was back to his old ways, no longer saying that he was sober in interviews. He was back to his blatant and over-the-top verbal promotion of his own alcohol and cocaine usage. Kind of very much just like seemingly the place he was in leading up to Reckless and Relentless. Good. Yeah? I'm really tired. just woke up? Yep, I just woke up. Um, and I've had no cocaine yet today, so I'm really sleepy. <laughs> Is that what keeps you up? Yeah! All energized! <laughs> Not just Monster, but cocaine and... Monster <laughs> energy drinks! And fireball whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, you're in Amsterdam now. I... What is Amsterdam known for? I'm in Amsterdam now. Um, Amsterdam is known for, I uh, will be known for not being prepared for me. <laughs> I'm going to take this city to his fucking knees. Um, okay. just hookers and drugs. Of course, that, that's the yeah. answer I expected. I, uh, for, for, for obvious reasons, I don't pay for sex though. So I'm just going to find a slut instead of a hooker. Oh, there's probably enough groupies out there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep, I'm going to have sex with a lady. Alright. I'm going to do drugs off her. Of her? Off her. Oh. I'm going to put the drugs on her and do them from her. Yeah? Do them from her person. On her belly? No, butthole. Great. One time I thought it was a good idea to put cocaine around the vagina and smell it up there. Okay. Then I realized that numbs it. The sex that numbs followed it? wasn't good. For her or for you? Both. Oh, that's strange. Cocaine has numbing qualities. Oh, okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting interview. <laughs> Interesting. It's like drugs 101. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get bad hangovers? No. No? What's your secret? Alcoholism. <laughs> oh shit. I just stay drunk. Okay. I'm drunk now. Okay, let's move on to the album, The okay. Important Things. Have you got a release date for it? Have you got a title for it? <sighs> no. It's not even finished. <laughs> no. I've been fucking around. I'll be I'll level with you. I've been very irresponsible. I've been very unprofessional. I disappeared, did a bunch of drugs, nearly died. That bit isn't particularly funny, but I, I think it is because I'm a dick. 
Um, and then I'm going to go back in the studio. I promise I will. I will go back in the studio and finish it this time. So I've heard, well, I've read that it's meant to be a little bit more mature sounding. It is, which is weird because I'm really immature. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, definitely more mature. I'll show you some of it later and then you can talk about how good it was. Okay, and be like, yeah, we'll do that. And he was so good looking on that song. It was a video? No, but you could just tell. <laughs> You can just tell by the masculine voice. Yeah. How, have you been playing new material on um, on this tour? Playing one new song called Run Free, which we've released. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only one. I want to play some more. As of yet, then, nothing to, nothing to confirm. No. 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 We can confirm that I'm a fuck up. <laughs> Regardless, in typical early 2010s Asking Alexandria fashion, the band proceeded to put a small ineffective band-aid on the gaping wound that was Danny's returning and worsening drug and alcohol habits and instead of like I was talking about earlier taking some time off like they probably should have done during this time they went out on the Monster Energy Outbreak Tour uh, anyway with Icy Stars taking the place of Suicide Silence. Icy Stars was actually free to hop on this tour, fun fact, uh, because they had just gotten kicked off of Falling in Reverse's The Thug and Me is you tour by Ronnie Radke uh, who was beefing with them at the time and he actually wrote a rap diss track about them called I Wash Cars but that's a, <laughs> that's a whole other story for a whole other day. Let's get it off. Motherfucking I see stars more like I wash cars cause I'm about to end your career in just 16 bars. So you can talk all the shit you want but it's never gonna take away, take away. how shitty of a band you are. just before the holidays, disaster struck yet again in the Asking Alexandria camp, and Danny Warstop actually tore a vocal cord uh, and was unable to sing for a bit. Now, this Loudwire article from uh, January 8th of 2013 explains this unfortunate situation in greater detail. We're, uh, we're doing a checkup after two weeks, uh, seeing how my vocal cords have been healing and getting better. I can already feel it start getting better, but we're gonna see. How long, uh, how long it's gonna be so I can go be fucking badass again? So you're originally from Texas? No, I'm originally from England. Just messing with you. I, well, it may have come up in my in my history because I lived in Texas for a while. Okay. Well, they, they didn't do this one. They did the uh, flex one, which goes up. It's just a big cable. It goes up your nose, and then down. And like right in front of your vocal cords. With a camera? Yeah. So and then we're gonna like, ah, 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 like watching my vocal cords. You know, you're like an athlete in training. You're how old now? 22. You're still a real young guy. And so 32 sounds like a long time from now. But let me tell you something when you're 32, you're gonna say, wow, it went like that. So if you take care of yourself now, you'll still have a great career 20, 30 years from now. Yeah. You know, uh, we want you more on the Mick Jagger path than the Jim Morrison path. Yeah. Okay? Eventually, Danny's voice healed enough for him to head back out on the road with AA, and they proceeded to play some festival dates and some European touring in early 2013. The 
before heading out on the Don't Pray For Us tour in April and May of 2013, which they headlined above openers Whitechapel, Motionless and White, and I Killed the Prom Queen. At this point, it was springtime, and the release date of Asking Alexandria's upcoming third album was pushed back yet again to the fall, uh, which according to the band was the direct result of Danny basically being too fucked up and going on binges all the time and not showing up to recording sessions left and right. He was apparently always just disappearing during this time. Uh, he wasn't acting like he was in it to win it when it came to all things Asking Alexandria related, you know? Danny also changed up his vocal style a bit during this time and began performing pretty much all of their older songs with less screamed vocals and more clean vocals in parts where there weren't clean vocals before, and of course all of his clean vocal ad-libbing was like 80s hair metal inspired melodies, and because of this, when they played live, all of the old songs kind of started to, like, they kind of lost their luster due to Danny's weird performances, and the vocals over the songs ended up sounding really out of place and disjointed, like this metalcore band has a rock and roll singer, just like Danny would say, but it didn't really work. That's the thing. It did. It, it, I don't feel like it really blended well. For example, just check out this performance of their classic hit single, The Final Episode, and the strange 80s tinged rock vocals that Danny puts all over it. approach, but to me it just doesn't really work. It sounded weird. It's not what you would, like, I, I feel like if you were at the show and you had no idea that he was gonna do that, it's like, what the fuck is this guy doing? I mean, I guess now looking back, some of his rock vocal flourishes do sound kind of cool. Maybe I'm giving him too much of a hard time about it. I mean, it might be the kind of thing where now that it's been like seven or eight years since this period of AA, I have a bit more appreciation for asking Alexandria during this time, especially live, just because it's so far in the rear view. Hindsight has the tendency to change how you look at certain things in life, you know? But at the time, for me and the rest of asking Alexandria's, you know, high school aged warp tour fan base, it was heartbreaking. It was like, ugh, ew, why is Danny putting all of these country butt rock vocal flourishes into these metalcore songs? Like, that's not necessarily what the fan base wanted out of Asking Alexandria. I mean, typically the young scene kid Warp Tour crowd at the time, who were into, like, the heavier side of things, were usually actually pretty anti butt rock, uh, as Warp Tour metalcore stuff tended to usually primarily appeal to kids who wanted something a little edgy and more in your face than like Shine Down or Five Finger Death Punch or Daughtry or whatever the fuck. Uh, so, so it was weird and kind of sad for that specific fan base at the time to sort of watch Danny go towards this route and bring down, well, not bring down, but bring this, you know, great. A uh, specific type of metalcore band into this realm that you know people didn't want it to go in. Um, and maybe now, in my old age of 24, maybe I just have more appreciation for butt rock, more of a tolerance for it, if you will, and Danny's live rock vocal flourishes don't, like, offend me now like they did in 2013. I don't know. It's all food for thought. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, also, I really wanted to mention this, but a lot of people, a lot of fans, 
blame the way that Danny sang during this time on his vocal cord injury just a few months prior. And yes, that probably had something to do with how raspy his voice sounded around this time, but I don't really think it ever was the reason why he stopped screaming as much or changed up his vocal style in general. Like I, you know, like we've covered, the dude famously wasn't super into metalcore anymore around this time. I don't think he even wanted to scream anymore. This was the start of Danny really genuinely wanting to be a rock singer, not a metalcore screamer. And I don't think that the vocal cord injury was really as much of a big deal as people make it out to be. Like, as much as his vocal cord surgery did make his voice noticeably a bit different and raspy and maybe a little bit weaker live, especially throughout 2013, I also think that his vocal rasp around this time had just as much to do with how heavily he smoked and drank and ultimately wasn't really taking care uh, of his physical or mental health around this period as well. Um, I felt like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I felt like I needed to bring this up because people still bring up the torn vocal cord thing to this day whenever Danny puts on like a mediocre live performance. Like, I'll be checking out a live Asking Alexandria video from like 2017 and maybe Danny seems like he's phoning it in a little bit or just having kind of an off day vocally and someone will comment, the reason Danny's voice sounds like this now is because he tore a vocal cord back in the day. He can't sing or scream like he used to. Like, motherfucker, no it's not. He tore a vocal cord back in 2012. Like, the human body is resilient. He's definitely, I'm assuming, probably more than fully healed at this point. And, like I said, I think Danny's change in vocal style at this time was a conscious effort. I think he did it on purpose. I don't think he changed anything because he tore a vocal cord. He was growing older. His voice was developing as he learned how to be a better vocalist and was figuring out just exactly what kind of vocalist he wanted to be, I think he would have sounded how he sounded around this time, vocal injury or not. It just made his voice a little weaker live in 2013, but he was still kind of killing it. I don't know. Aside from the, the, the 80s, the rock and roll flourishes o over the screaming parts. That stuff is still a little weird. Um, anyways, <laughs> so after the, uh, don't, let's get back on track here. After the Don't Pray For Us tour wrapped up in the spring of 2013, the band did a bunch more festival dates before heading out on the From Death to Destiny Midwest CD release tour, which is quite literally exactly what it sounds like. And this, my friends finally leads me to the release of the long-awaited, highly anticipated third Asking Alexandria album, From Death to Destiny. Oh, here we go. We have, after eight months of semi-hard work and extreme unprofessionalism, completed our brand new album, From Death to Destiny! Do you guys want to hear some new songs off that record? Germany, do you want some new fucking songs off that record? This is our brand new single. This is called The Death of Me. Yes, From Death to Destiny, the third official full-length studio album from Asking Alexandria was released on August 6th of 2013 uh, through Sumerian Records and was produced by metalcore superstar producer Joey Sturgis. Fun fact, it was released almost one whole year, almost to the day since the release of the album's first single, Run Free, which was put out on August 13th of 2012, which just shows like how fragmented and pushed back the recording process was, which, like I said, you know, was due to the severity of Danny's relapse and worsening drug and alcohol problems during the recording process. It took him a while. And apparently Danny's vocals were recorded in a bunch of different studios in a bunch of different locations all over the place, while the rest of the band recorded in just one place because, you know, they were holding it together enough 
Danny wasn't. And at this point, more than ever, Danny's interest in being a contributing member of the band Asking Alexandria was very much in question. Uh, the band has later stated that it was very, very difficult for them uh, to write and work with Danny for this album because their musical interests had changed so separately from each other's, and Danny was apparently becoming less and less willing to write vocals or do anything over heavy parts, and was very adamant about not wanting to scream as much and not want to, you know, not wanting to have songs with as many breakdowns or as many heavy sections. The rest of the band, however, were still passionate about heavy music and still wanted heavy sections in their songs, but apparently Danny was just being incredibly stubborn about what he wanted and was rejecting demos sent to him by the band left and right for being too heavy or too similar to the band's old music. This was happening so much that according to Ben and the rest of the band, they basically, they kind of had to compromise their creativity a bit and maybe write some material that they were less than passionate about or just forced to be in more of a straightforward hard rock direction instead of a heavy direction just to basically please Danny so that he'll be a part of it and be excited about it and want to work on it. Because of this fork in the road between Danny's and the rest of the band's musical interests, From Death to Destiny is kind of a strange record and kind of always has been. At the end of the day, the sound on From Death to Destiny is a hybrid of Warped Tour metalcore chugs and 80s hard rock arena hair metal. Uh, and to be fair, I actually think From Death to Destiny is a pretty unique record because of this. I think they really did combine these genres in a different way than their peers who were combining the same genres, like Blackville Brides or Ronnie Radke. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I've always felt like this record has a bit of like, I don't know, a 90s sort of post-grunge kind of vibe to it. Like, I don't want to say Alice in Chains necessarily as a reference band, but something something like that in that world. I feel like the sound of this album pushes into that direction a little bit in certain places, which sounds really cool. It's a really cool aspect of the sound of this album, and it's especially cool to me because, like I said, I don't know if the band exploring that kind of post-grunge sound was necessarily intentional, or if it was just a happy accident, a byproduct, if you will, of the band's unique blend of metalcore and 80s rock. I do think that this album was the perfect logical next step for the band after Reckless and Relentless. I think AA did a perfect job of refining the heavy sections while beefing up the rock sections. I mean, let's be real. This this is a, an excellent example of one of those albums where the band, you know, in interviews is like, it's heavier but more melodic, that kind of thing. I will say... I like this album. Personally, I think it's a super strong record almost all of the way through. There are a couple songs here and there that are maybe a little more forgettable than others, um, and a, there are a handful of very obvious standouts, but all in all, I think it's a good album. Uh, I think the songs are written well, the record sounds good, I like the blend of metalcore and 80s rock. I kind of like the fact that there was this like inner band turmoil going on and controversy surrounding the record. It kind of makes it more like the record's sounds more dramatic because of it, you know what I mean? Even in the songs, like, you can tell that there was, uh, unrest going on in the band just by the sound of the record, I feel like. And I like how Asking Alexandria really pushed the boundaries of what people maybe thought possible of a band like Asking Alexandria on this album. Although I would consider From Death to Destiny still very much Asking Alexandria in their classic era, it's obviously the first album where they pushed things in to a bit more of an active radio rock, big arena rock direction, just like their metalcore peers were doing around that same time with similar records like Semp Eternal by Bring Me the Horizon in 2013 or Restoring Force by Of Mice and Men in 2014. New metalcore, people were calling it. For real, there's even a Wikipedia page about it. <laughs> but that's the thing. A good majority of Asking Alexandria's fans were not too keen on this new album and their overall new direction. A lot of people called this album country butt rock. <laughs> they called it bad and not good. And to a lot of people, the general consensus amongst fans was that Asking Alexandria was starting to lose their way a little bit. And tensions between the band and Danny were casting a huge shadow over 
for everything. And a lot of people really did not like this record at the time when it came out. I remember it. It really did get a lot of hate and backlash from fans, especially online. Um, it's kind of shifted now over time since it's been like seven or eight years or whatever. The popular opinion has changed since then, and it seems like now most people love From Death to Destiny and actually wish Asking Alexandria still sounded today like they sounded back on this record. This record is a lot more celebrated now, um, but it's still kind of a weird record, and it's the first record in Asking Alexandria's catalog where the fan base was, as a whole, really split on whether they liked it or not. And still to this day, there are plenty of people who don't like From Death to Destiny, um, whether it be because this was Asking Alexandria's first real step away from their original direction, or for any of the other countless reasons why From Death to Destiny was kind of a weird album and a weird time for Asking Alexandria in general. Anyways, let's fucking get into the songs on this thing, shall we? Now, don't pray for me, man. This song is fucking awesome. This shit slaps. This shit's fucking juiced. The perfect opener, probably my favorite opening track on any Asking Alexandria album. It has a long kind of industrial electronic build-up intro, which sounds really cool. Uh, and it actually plays some clips from the crazy Seattle show in 2011 where Danny got way too hammered. A cool kind of cinematic way to open up the record uh, and is also an obvious reference to all of the insanity and instability the band were going through in the process of making an album. That's what that's the, you know, the first foot that they're starting off on, which is pretty bold. The first words in this song and on this album are, you're fucking crazy if you think that I'll ever change. And with that, we're off to the races. Now, this song is definitely a big fuck you to the haters and the naysayers, and also Danny's personal way of saying, I am who I am, no matter what what you think of it or what you want from me, a pretty controversial opening statement coming from a man so controversial himself, uh, who was almost known more so at the time for his dark vices as opposed to his music in a lot of cases. And man, what a great fucking way to start a record. Don't Pray For Me has got a big open arena rock chorus and also manages to be heavy as balls with more refined and honed in breakdowns, which I appreciate. Uh, it perfectly sets the precedent for the rest of the record with true anthemic rock metal power. From there, we barrel through Killing You and The Death of Me, two very solid standout songs, two singles actually, both of these had music videos, and I believe The Death of Me was the lead single being promoted leading up to the actual release of the album. Uh, both of these songs completely push the boundaries of anything Asking Alexandria had done before, while still like remaining true to the band's roots, I think. The band was still heavy, but in, you know, more of a mature, straight-up metal way. Uh, with truly great hard rock inspired choruses from Danny. The choruses are kind of reminiscent of choruses from songs from the last album, like Another Bottle Down or the song Reckless and Relentless, that more straightforward hard rock vibe that Danny was just flirting with on the record before became a fully fleshed out gigantic beast on From Death to Destiny, specifically on songs like, you know, Killing You or uh, The Death of Me. Danny's vocals in general on this album are just, I don't know, more like manly than ever before. <laughs> I don't know. Um, besides being noticeably way more raspy than before and pretty obviously struggling to hit certain high notes like in the beginning of Killing You or in the chorus of The Death of Me, besides that, Danny has way more character than ever before on this album and his voice is way more developed than ever before. Anyone who tried to say Danny sucked vocally on this album, I straight up disagree. I think he was great great on this record, it was just simply a lot different than anything he had done before. So people were like surprised and not sure what to think, you know? One thing that I do have to bring up about this album is, uh, and I kind of mentioned this earlier when I was talking about uh, the release of Run Free, um, but Asking Alexandria brought to the table for the first time songs with positive lyrics and uplifting messages behind them. You know, it wasn't just dark, dark, I'm on drugs, like 
fucking craziness. Uh, songs like Run Free or Believe, as well as the all-clean vocal, straight-up, made-for-active-rock radio Break Down the Walls, featured inspiring, hopeful lyrics like, or... Now, apparently, these more positive songs were written during that period in 2012, where Danny was, like, clean and sober, and I guess he had some sort of new lease on life at the time, and, you know, felt inspired to make more positive music to sort of counteract the negative energy that Asking had always put out, put forth in their music prior. And then, on the flip side, you have, like, all the other songs on the record. Songs like The Heaviest song on the album and a semi callback to the stand up and scream days poison uh to the almost black veil brides meets avenge sevenfold 80s glam rock banger white line fever uh which this song also kind of sounds like a heavier buck cherry to me a little bit white line fever i don't know um or the two softer songs on the record where the lyrics of both are basically just danny confessing that he's sick of touring and wants to go the fuck home those songs being moving on and the road these songs are dark <laughs> like real fucking dark um even when it kind of sounds like it could be lighthearted, like on white line fever it's kind of a jokey fun like a fun upbeat party rock song uh not party rock like lmfao i should say like a rock party song like buck cherry but the song's lyrics are about being addicted to cocaine that's not good that's very very on some dark ass parts of life type shit licking every drop of poison off a pocket of keys while some daddy's little angels getting down on their knees Oh man, okay, Danny, living it up, brother. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> God. And yeah, apparently these darker songs uh, were, I'm assuming, all written after Danny had relapsed on drink and drugs and gotten himself back into a very negative space again. I mean, that would make sense, right? The other uh, straight up hard rock song, which I just mentioned, Break Down the Walls, which was a single, but I don't think it did very well in that regard, but I, I, I honestly fucking love this song, man. It's corny. It's a very corny track, but it's just straight up like good old fashioned rock. You know what I mean? It's like they genuinely did a really good job at just being like, you know, a straight up heavy rock band on this album. And this song, in my opinion, is a perfect execution of that. Maybe that's a hot take because this song isn't talked about a whole lot, but I think it's pretty underrated. I, I think it's a banger. Um, <laughs> moving on is a very important song, both on this record and in the catalog of Asking Alexandria as a whole. Uh, moving on is to this album what Someone Somewhere was to Reckless and Relentless. This song is a straight-up mid-tempo rock ballad, very 80s tinged, very uh, kind of like Skid Row sounding, like 18 and Life by Skid Row kind of, which the band did cover previously. Super different this song is from anything Asking Alexandria had done before, super different from anything else on this album even. It's got a really amazing, soaring, big, emotional arena rock chorus, but the funny thing is, it's literally a note-for-note ripoff of Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac. But yeah, either way, this song was and is definitely the biggest song on this record. It's got like 40 million Spotify plays, which is way higher than the rest of the album. It's a pretty obvious musical departure for Asking Alexandria. The vibe is way different, and it's a good song. But that's the thing. I don't think Moving On is a great song. I think it's uh I think it's okay but I I think it's a little overhyped, a little overrated. I don't know. It's fine. I'm not mad at it. Um but I really don't think it's that amazing of a rock song and like I said, the chorus is literally just a recycled Fleetwood Mac chorus note for note. So that in itself kind of makes me be like, "Eh, I'm a way bigger fan of the next song on the track list on this album, The Road," uh which sounds to me kind of like a sister song to Moving On because it's also kind of a lower key song compared to the rest of the record and it also deals with these same topics lyrically topics like not wanting to be in the band asking alexandria the road is a fucking awesome song in my opinion super underrated amazing choruses amazing instrumentals it really brings forth and captures such a cool vibe and it's so unique and well executed and different um i wish more songs on the album sounded like the road uh the choruses are almost like alt country but it 
totally works in my opinion and bangs and like isn't corny when it totally could be corny if it's not executed well enough you know also towards the end of this song the road there's some breakdowns in there which are very reminiscent of like the styles of breakdowns from reckless and relentless if you ask me uh with some cool industrial style flair in there which you could make the argument that they sound a little bit forced in there and unnecessary but i don't know I think the breakdown sounds sick. I love that song. I love The Road. And you know, I do have to mention, besides uh, the awesome standout songs on this album, there are some clunkers. Uh, this is not a perfect album all the way through. For example, songs like Believe or Creature. I don't know. They're not bad songs, but they're just kind of there, you know? They just exist. They're like veering into filler territory. The last track on the record too, Until the End, which features some great guest vocals and a great hook from fucking Howard Jones from motherfucking Kill Switch Engage, which is awesome. Despite how epic that Howard Jones feature is and how this song does have a cool experimental edge to it, it kind of misses the mark and is a bit unmemorable and underwhelming. Danny literally Literally closes off the song and closes off this record by saying, I'm sick and tired of being admired. I don't deserve this pedestal you've put me on. All I want is to be proud of who I am. I brought this hell upon myself. Now I've got to see it through until the end. I mean, more lyrics about I mean, what else could this be about? This is literally about not wanting to be in Asking Alexandria. What a crazy record. Like I said, it's a weird record. It's a weird record. Like, there's lyrics from the singer about, like, being sick of being on tour. Like, you're listening to this record almost feeling bad for this guy. I don't know, man. It's wild. It's almost sad, but it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. Either way, either way, upon release from Death to Destiny charted at number fucking five on the Billboard 200, which was the highest the band had ever charted, and I'm pretty sure has ever charted to this day. I'm actually 100% sure of that. And it also sold 41,082 copies within its first week, which was the highest first week sales of any band on Sumerian Records up until that point, uh, which is pretty fucking crazy. The album has also apparently sold sold uh like 151,000 copies in the US as of March of 2016. That's a lot of records. So yeah, this album did pretty well. This was their commercial peak. It was their louder now if you will. From critics, the album received reviews that were of the positive to mixed variety. All Music wrote that the album showed a maturation of the band, a move away from simplistic girls and drugs metalcore to produce a more personal hard rock album, which showed, hey, which showed post-grunge influence, there you go, uh, with the metalcore parts smoothed down considerably. Couldn't have said it better myself, All Music. 